So when you're approaching this, you want to think you're not starting at the beginning and moving straight to the end. You're going to learn in layers. So the first layer of information is the histology and anatomy. And I will include in the description a video that I have done about histology and anatomy if you've not gotten started with that. Now, once you get down the histology and anatomy, you're kind of safe to move forward to the hormones that are being released from those endocrine organs. Now, I'm not saying you can't learn any hormone names while you're learning your histology, but really, when you're learning histology and anatomy, just focus on that. Don't drive yourself crazy. Once you're done, then you really want to commit yourself to memorizing those names. So when you can take a chart like this and fill it in from nothing or create it from nothing, actually, you're ready to move on. And I will also include this blank and filled in in the description. Those first two layers are essentially your characters and settings. Once you understand that, you're good to move on. You can start learning some of the plot points. The third layer is you're going to want to understand and memorize the basic effect of each hormone. So this outline, when you're first learning, you might fill this in a little more simply than what I have done here. Uh, for example, parathyroid hormone instead of filling out all this information you can just say increases blood calcium like that is good enough to start with once you have that down now you're going to move on to your fourth layer so the basic effects that's the end of the story you know the characters and settings the end of the story now you're going to use the basic pattern of hormone function to add in all of the details. So any hormone is going to follow this basic pattern. You can think of the stimulus. That's how we know that there is a problem that we need to fix. That stimulus is going to be detected by the endocrine organ. Remember from homeostasis, you have to have a control center. Um, just conversationally, I like to think of the endocrine organ like it is the detector. It detects there is a problem and it's the messenger because it is going to send the message there is a problem. The hormone itself is the message. So how do hormones get around the body? They're released into the bloodstream. So that hormone is released into the bloodstream. It travels all over the body until it reaches the cells that are able to respond to it. So the cells have to have a receptor of some kind. So that's going to be the target. You can think of the target as the message receiver and the problem fixer. And the effect is the solution to the problem. So we're going to look at antidiuretic hormone and you'll see how it follows that basic pattern. And you'll also see like you want to have this effect memorized because the other parts of the pathway are going to relate back to the effect and will be easier to remember if you've already memorized the effect. So the main effect is you're going to increase H2O reabsorption by the kidney. Reabsorption just means you're putting it back into the bloodstream instead of letting yourself urinate it out. So because you put it back into the bloodstream, you decrease your urination and over time in combination with drinking, that can also increase your blood volume and increase your blood pressure. So our initial stimulus is that there is an increase in blood osmolarity. Don't let that word confuse you. Um, osmolarity is just how concentrated a solution is. So you can just say to yourself, like it's increased blood saltiness. Your blood is becoming more concentrated. If your blood is more concentrated, that means you're dehydrated. There's not enough water in your blood. 
So it makes sense that at the end of the day, we're trying to stop ourselves from urinating because if you already don't have enough water in your blood, you don't want to urinate more. So this is our initial stimulus. That is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. Um, so those osmoreceptors fire when the salinity reaches a certain point and that action potential spreads down to the nerve which ends in the posterior pituitary and once the action potential reaches the end of the nerve that causes the release of ADH into the bloodstream. So who's going to fix this problem for us? These are our messengers and our message about the problem flows all throughout the bloodstream until it reaches the kidney, which we actually kind of already included in our effect. So the ADH targets the kidney and causes it to reabsorb more water. Like we said, that means you're going to urinate less over time, increase your blood volume and blood pressure. And in combination with drinking in time, that will help decrease your blood osmolarity back into your normal range. Now, I'll also mention, um, you might see like a whole list of stimuli. Sometimes the pathway is exactly the same for each stimuli, sometimes it's a little different. In this case, another potential stimulus that could set this pathway off would be a decrease in blood volume and blood pressure, like maybe from massive blood loss. That is going to be detected by baroreceptors um, baro means pressure, like a barometer measures air pressure, a baroreceptor senses pressure within your blood vessels, and that is ultimately going to cause the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary, and then the, all the same stuff is going to happen. Now what we have not yet mentioned are inhibitors and diseases. So we'll start with the inhibitors first. What does an inhibitor do? An inhibitor is going to prevent the release or prevent the proper functioning of the hormone. Now there are two kind of main categories of inhibitors. Um, this is something I've just made up in my own mind to kind of separate them. You have your negative feedback and your override. So Remember, what's the definition of negative feedback? It is when your stimulus and your response are in opposite directions. So essentially, you're eliminating the stimulus by the end of the pathway, which shuts off the pathway. Same thing here. Once your blood pressure gets up into the normal range, that would shut off this pathway. So if it, most hormones do operate on negative feedback, um, except for oxytocin. So for the most part, this will apply, like one of the inhibitors is just gonna be the opposite of whatever the stimuli was. Then there's also, I just call this the override situation where you might have an appropriate stimulus, um, but there's something that is interfering with the pathway. Now, sometimes there might be a good reason that you want the pathway to be interfered with. Like there might be extenuating circumstances like, hey guys, like it's not a good time to do this thing right now. But in the case of ADH, um, the override stimulus, there's no good reason for it. It's just the way it is. And probably most of you have experienced this. Alcohol. So alcohol interferes with the proper functioning of ADH, not because it affects the release, but because it affects the ability of ADH to bind to the kidney tubules. So you can't, if your ADH can't bind to the kidney tubules, you can't increase your water reabsorption. Uh, and that's why when you pee or when you um, drink, you pee so much because your ADH is not functioning. All right, so this is the general information 
get this down. Um, this is your fourth layer, and then we'll call the next layer 4B. That's your diseases. So the endocrine system has two broad categories of disorders. You have disorders of hyposecretion, where you're not secreting enough hormone, and hypersecretion, where you're secreting too much hormone. So hyposecretion, you can think, if you don't have enough of this hormone, you can't create the effect. Whatever the effect is that you're trying to get to at the end of the day, you can't get there because you don't have the hormone. Hypersecretion, you have far too much of the effect. So that's why it's really important that you want to have the effects memorized because you'll see that all of the symptoms we're going to look at are in some way related to the effect. So a hyposecretion of ADH would result in a disorder called diabetes insipidus. Do not confuse this with the diabetes you're familiar with. That's diabetes mellitus. That is to do with blood sugar. I'll explain why they're both diabetes in a minute, but for now, just know this has nothing to do with blood sugar at all. So diabetes insipidus has two main types. There's the central kind, which is caused by a problem in the brain, because remember the hypothalamus and the pituitary are in charge of releasing ADH and they're in your brain, or nephrogenic, which means there's some sort of problem on the kidney end where you're not able to respond to the ADH. So in the case of the nephrogenic, like no, that would not be technically hyposecretion. Maybe you have enough ADH, you just can't respond to it, but we're not splitting hairs here. Conceptually, it's gonna act the same as if it were a hyposecretion, even though it does have a different kind of chain of events that cause it. So diabetes insipidus could be caused by head trauma or a tumor, um, because once again, head trauma or tumor in the brain could affect that part of the brain and stop it from functioning properly. Kidney disease um, or genetic abnormalities with your kidneys also could cause it. And now using your powers of logic, I want you to think, what are my symptoms going to be if I don't have enough ADH based on what we know the effects of ADH are? So there's a lot of things you could have thought that would have made sense. Um, primarily, Diabetes insipidus is going to cause excessive thirst and urination. So your kidneys are not resorbing enough water. So you're urinating all the time. And because you're urinating all the time, you're super thirsty. You're always drinking, always peeing. It's probably miserable. Now, as long as you are physically capable of drinking, you can kind of stave off the issues of low blood volume and um, having blood that is too concentrated. However, if you were physically unable to drink or if you had some sort of head injury or in a coma that prevented you from drinking, if it went untreated, it would be life-threatening because it's gonna cause electrolyte imbalances. And when you get to the acid-base chapter, you'll see how many problems um, you know, electrolyte imbalances can cause. Okay, so now, why are they both called diabetes? Um, diabetes means an overflow or an overproduction of urine. Diabetes mellitus, mellitus means sweet. Diabetes mellitus, people are peeing a lot because they have high blood sugar. So this is sweet pee. Diabetes insipidus, insipidus is like clear. Um, so this is like, clear pee because you don't have ADH. So both disorders you're peeing, that's where the diabetes is from, it's just for different reasons. So the hypersecretion, if you have too much effect, that is the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. 
And this can also be caused by head trauma, although this is a multiple choice test and you had to go with one. Uh, diabetes insipidus is far more associated with head trauma than the syndrome of inappropriate ADH. I think the syndrome of inappropriate ADH is more strongly associated with tumors, um, specifically, like you could have some sort of pituitary tumor or other brain tumor possibly. I'm not entirely certain, but I do know that lung, certain types of lung cancer are prone to causing this because for whatever reason, there's specific types of lung cancers that secrete it's either ADH or chemically close enough to ADH that it mimics, it mimics the action of it once it gets into your bloodstream. All right, now using your powers of logic, I want you to think if I have too much ADH based on the effects, what are my symptoms gonna be like? So too much ADH, I'm gonna be absorbing too much water even when I don't need to be so that is going to decrease the amount that I'm urinating and if I'm not getting rid of enough water that is going to decrease my blood osmolarity so decrease the concentration of my blood it's going to be too dilute with water which can result or will result in hyponatremia Hypo is low, Na for sodium, emia is for blood, so you will end up with low blood sodium. So once again, because you can't pee, you're going to get water retention, which can lead to swelling. If you retain too much water, that is going to increase your blood pressure because you've got too much water in your pipes. It's going to increase the pressure on the walls, but also... The edema can actually make your brain swell, which would cause confusion. And if your brain is swelling enough, eventually you are going to die. So both of these disorders can be fatal if they are not properly managed. So that is my advice for you. That is the basic pattern you should follow. I hope you agree that when you look at it like that, it does make sense. And kind of my last bit of advice is once you get all this information together, you want to consolidate it all in one place. Now, this is something that I put together as an example for students. I actually tried to make this look a little neater. I know it's actually not really that neat, but as a student, mine was a lot sloppier. The basic premise is like you want to get this information into as small an area as possible. And personally, I think like either do the flow chart or summarize it like this. Um, don't spend ages and ages trying to make something pretty. You just want something to refer back to, not to capture every detail, just to jog your memory as to what you learned. All right, I hope that was helpful. Have a great day and have fun learning.